hope you're all leaving here with a lot of new knowledge about uh, caring for gender nonconforming and transgender youth. Um, this, this last talk, I'm going to be team presenting with Ellen Selke. So I wanted to just briefly introduce Ellen before I start talking. Uh, Dr. Selke is a professor, uh, associate professor of adolescent medicine at the University of Michigan. Uh, she's the second doctor on the team. The two of us see the patients that are referred to the clinic. Um, and Dr. Selke also is the research director for the Gender and Adolescent Clinic, the Child and Adolescent Gender Clinic. Um, she's currently doing research on social media use in trans youth and has also studied bullying in schools extensively. Um, and she's going to be talking um, about hormones during this talk. So thank you, Ellen. I have no financial relationships to disclose. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> so I'm going to start by presenting a couple brief vignettes. And I'm going to review some of the approaches that we use in clinic um, from a medical perspective. I, th I think that we feel like it's important that you all have the understanding of what are the medical options that your clients or students may be, may be offered by, by doctors, what are some of the hormone or um, surgical interventions that they may be asking for, what are some of the possibilities of different age groups. Uh, so we'll go through that. And then we'll outside, uh, outline some of the challenges and barriers to care uh, that uh, transgender patients may face when accessing the the healthcare um, office, um, healthcare in general. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Norm Spack. Dr. Spack was my mentor when I was a fellow in pediatric endocrinology. He's sort of the founder of pediatric endocrinology, transgender healthcare for adolescents in the United States. He became interested in working with trans youth and actually then went to the Netherlands where they had been pioneering uh, treatments for transgender persons for the longest uh, in, in Europe. He brought that information back and founded the GEMS Clinic at Boston Children's Hospital. The GEMS Clinic stood for the, um, the Gender Management Services Clinic. And that became the first multidisciplinary gender team at a children's hospital in the United States back in the early 90s. Since that time, similar clinics have uh, been founded at almost every children's hospital across the country. Um, and the clinic at Mott Children's Hospital is based on the clinic that Dr. Spack set up uh, in Boston. But the clinic he set up in Boston was based on what they started doing in Amsterdam um, in, in treating trans youth in the Dutch protocol, which became the current standards of care. So I'm going to go through that with you today. So I think that this picture from the Netherlands really is an impressive one to me. And that's because everyone in this picture is transgender. But that if you met any of these kids on the streets in Amsterdam or in the park, you wouldn't look at them twice as that there's anything different about their gender identity, right? That, that they look just like the gender that they are, are living and affirming. And that. Um, it's impossible to tell there's anything different about their gender identity because all of these kids are prepubertal. They haven't started developing secondary sex characteristics that make it more difficult for them to live and pass as the gender that they affirm. Now in the, in the Netherlands, they were talking to adult transgender people and they were hearing about their stories, their lives, and hearing from them that adolescence was so difficult for them because they were watching their bodies take off in the wrong direction, go through the wrong puberty, develop the wrong secondary sex characteristics. That increased their anxiety and depression, but it also caused them to struggle in terms of uh, trying to hide those secondary sex characteristics now as an adult. It made their lives more difficult. And a lot of them were expressing the fact that they felt like the very first thing that anyone thought when they saw them was, that's a transgender person. That's not the very first thing that they want, wanted someone to think when they saw them. So in the Netherlands, they said, this is a tricky problem because puberty starts when you're like 10, 11 years old. Not the ideal age to be making decisions about anything, much less making a medical transition. So that, that became the uh, sort of the conundrum. So case one, 
Timmy is presenting to the pediatrician at age eight years. Since about age four, he's very much wished that he were a girl, often saying, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. Been playing dress up, playing with dolls, some of that stereotypic behavior that Dr. Olson was describing, um, and throwing tantrums when redirected from these behaviors. Uh, recently came to his mom and said, I just want to chop off my penis. And for a while they were saying, well, our Timmy's probably going to grow up and be gay. But now with this, with this kind of frightening statement, uh, the parents are saying, I think there might be something else going on here. We need some help. We need some advice. So this could be Timmy. Case two, Sarah, who goes by the name Scott. is a 14-year-old born female presenting uh, to the endocrinologist with his parents referred by the pediatrician. So Scott made a social transition when he was 12. He, uh, at that time, was very clear on his male uh, gender identity. That seemed to help at the time. He had been isolated, but after making that social, translation, tran uh, social transition, uh, was more uh, engaged with others, more um, confident and comfortable. Uh, but now that he is noticing breast development and really worried about starting menses, uh, things are starting to take a backslide. Very concerned about the prospect of starting menstruation. And he's cutting. So this is data that comes from Dr. Spack's clinic. Uh, I think that throughout the course of the day, we've, we've tried to present gender identity as a normal human characteristic that exists on a spectrum with a lot of diversity, and that diversity should be celebrated. Um, however, that people that are transgender uh, have higher rates of other psychiatric comorbidity. So coming in the front door to Dr. Speck's clinic, 45% had already been diagnosed with another psychiatric diagnosis, and 11% had attempted suicide. The rates of these things are similar at, uh, for children coming into our clinic. And, uh, and the, then the question becomes, you know, could a medical transition be helpful uh, with the goals of di reducing distress and dysphoria, improving quality of life, and reducing psychiatric comorbidity? So some data on the, uh, the kids that have come to Mott Children's Hospital in the last two years since it was founded. Uh, we've seen about 200 kids referred from all parts of the state of Michigan. About half and half boys and girls in the youngest kids. But in the teenagers, we're seeing about a two to one ratio of male identified to female identified. So more trans boys are coming to see us than trans girls in high school. <clears throat> when a patient is referred to the gender clinic, the very first thing that happens is they meet with Sarah or Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay's over there. Uh, our two amazing social workers. They'll spend about. Uh, They'll do a complete psychosocial and gender assessment. If they are being seen in, uh, by a therapist in the community, they'll uh, uh, want any documentation that the therapist might have uh, regarding their, their gender identity history. Um, if there's any questions, then, then they would communicate with you. And then they would uh, come back with some recommendations. The recommendation would oftentimes be to see one of the physicians, myself or Dr. Selke or perhaps to see Dr. Quigley, the psychiatrist that works on the team. And uh, at, the, at the medical appointment, then uh, the, the, med the medical doctor, me or, or Ellen, would be talking with them about the hormonal options appropriate for them. So this is a, a graph that depicts the normal differences in testosterone across the lifespan. And I use this picture to sort of demonstrate what the endocrinologist is thinking when we see transgender kids. So in prepubertal life, in, uh, in fetal life rather, there's a big difference in testosterone. The male fetuses have a lot of testosterone. The female fetuses have very little testosterone. And that difference in hormones in fetal life causes the differences in our genitalia, in our internal and external genitals, and is is the cause for when the doctor says it's a boy or it's a girl. It's due to that difference in hormones. Then there's that little blip. That's called the mini puberty of infancy, which has no known um, purpose. But there's a little surge in testosterone once a baby boy is born. And then there's that period of time where there's very little 
testosterone or estrogen being made by the body. That's pre-puberty. Then again, there's a big difference in, in hormone levels during puberty. So this is really nice because when a prepubertal child is thinking critically about their gender and considering a gender transition, a social transition, there's no medical intervention that would ever be re uh, re uh, needed or helpful. The body isn't making uh, hormones that you would want to block. The body's not time to be making hormones that they may want. So you can focus on you know, meeting with a, a mental health professional, talking through your gender, exploring that with your family, um, and making decisions more on a social pr perspective rather than a medical perspective. But then when puberty starts, the body starts making hormones that are causing some changes that if, uh, if a child's sex and gender don't line up, those changes are going to cause changes to, are going to cause potentially distress. So Dr. Spack would say, that trans youth suffer from two medical problems that pediatric endocrinologists have been treating for decades. They have precocity of the wrong puberty and they have delay of the right puberty. So we know how to treat precocious puberty, we suppress it. We know how to treat delayed puberty, we give hormones. And if you combine those two together, then you know how to treat a transgender patient. So the, quest, the question is, you know, what is a, I mentioned that, that patients would come and have a, a psychosocial and gender assessment. Um, and what is a gender assessment? So that's a really good question. Uh, different, different clinicians think of a gender assessment as different things. Some use tools like scales where um, they're trying to quantify gender and gender dysphoria. Um, however, um, uh, our clinicians use one scale and they also just talk a lot with the client about their gender history, getting a sense for things like, you know, when did they, uh, getting a sense from the parents about what they noticed as when they were a young child, what their memories of early childhood were, what their experiences with puberty have been, if puberty has happened, and, and getting sort of a comprehensive look at gender in all of those different contexts. So it's more of a, a talk assessment than, than a pen and paper assessment. So the, uh, the Dutch then said, okay, puberty happens when you're 10 or 11. We don't think that's an appropriate time to make permanent decisions, but we could use medicines that we use in precocious puberty to block puberty, put puberty on pause. That would be a reversible intervention such that you would postpone the development of those secondary sex characteristics that align with the biologic sex, but allow time to pass so that the child could make a more a more balanced decision um, with their families about starting on medicines which have irreversible effects like testosterone or estrogen. And they, they ended up using the age 16 as the cutoff for starting testosterone or estrogen in the Netherlands simply because age 16 is the age of consent in the Netherlands. So in practice this would mean the transgender young child would come to the doctor occasionally for puberty staging exams, and then once puberty was just starting, if they continued to identify as transgender, they would start on medicine to pause puberty until they were 16, then they would start on testosterone or estrogen if they continued to identify that way. Then they could be eligible for a surgery um, uh, when they turned 18. Now, this became the standards of care published by the WPATH and the Endocrine Society, but over time, We've, we've thought that you know, having age cutoffs for developmental milestones seems a little rigid and that putting someone in this pubertal hold pattern until they're 16 um, is not practical when someone's been living as a boy or girl their whole life and is watching all of their peers take off into puberty. So I want to talk about the medicines that, um, that are used by physicians to, to block pubertal hormones. So when I think about medicines that are used by transgender persons, I think of them in two buckets. Medicines that lower the hormones that your body makes, or medicines that give you the hormones that your body isn't making. And uh, I'm going to talk about the medicines in that first bucket, the medicines that lower the hormones that your body makes. So blockers are what the patients typically call them. Blockers block puberty. GnRH analogs, those are the medications also called Lupron or Suprelin, that are used to treat precocious puberty, 
that basically tell the signal from the brain uh, that is communicating with the testicles or ovaries that puberty should be starting, it turns that signal off and it puts puberty on pause. The advantages of using GnRH analogs is that um, you're, you're preventing the development of those characteristics which would cause more distress and would make it harder for them to live as that gender in the future uh, without being misgendered, uh, and uh, that it's reversible. So if you stop taking the medicine to tell puberty to pause, then puberty will just pick up where it left off. Uh, some of the, the cons of using this medicine, well, you are prolonging pre-puberty in someone for longer than it would normally be. So someone that would normally start puberty at 11, they're going to be in puberty limbo until you make a decision about starting testosterone or estrogen. This could be socially difficult. And also, puberty is not just about developing breasts or developing you know, pubic hair. It's also about getting stronger bones. It's about you know, um, emotional development. So you're also you know, delaying some of the parts of puberty that are not specific to sex, like um, you know, bone strength development. Now we think that someone that's been suppressed with pubertal suppression and then starts on testosterone or estrogen later will have catch-up growth in terms of their bone strength. Um, but that's been a concern that requires more investigation. These medicines that put puberty on pause, Lupron and Hystrelin, are incredibly expensive and are not affordable to almost anyone unless they're covered by insurance. So behind the scenes, we're working with insurance companies to get these medicines approved, but this can be a, a significant barrier when someone has an insurance that is, is not um, interested in covering these medications. Fortunately, the testosterone and estrogen that Dr. Selke will talk about um, are more affordable. We're pretty good at convincing insurance companies to cover it, so um, I, I can be pretty convincing. <laughs> so, um, so what are some, some of the other medicines in that bucket of lowering the hormones that the body makes? Um, take, for example, a trans man or a trans boy that's having periods, and the periods are causing a lot of distress, but they're not ready to commit to starting testosterone they could take a birth control pill every day, and that would eliminate their periods. But if you say that you should start a birth control with extra estrogen in it, they're not going to be so keen on that. So birth control pills are estrogen and progesterone combination. That's why they're called combination oral contraceptive pills. But if you take the estrogen out, it's just progesterone. If you take progesterone every day, that would eliminate the, day, the monthly period. And that's a common thing that I would do in an older trans boy that is having trouble with periods but not ready to start testosterone. And then spironolactone. Spironolactone has a funny story. It's actually a, um, a diuretic that's used in congestive heart failure. And so they would be giving these old guys with congestive heart failure spironolactone, and they were noticing that they didn't have to shave very much anymore. <laughs> so it turns out that spironolactone has a side effect as an androgen blocker. So trans women take spironolactone to block or blunt the effect of their testosterone and uh, help them to not develop as much facial and body hair. So those are the other two medicines in, in this first bucket. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Selke. She's going to start with the second bucket. I am a pediatrician, but I did an extra three-year fellowship to work specifically with adolescents. And so um, I kind of liken our specialty to geriatrics in adults. So um, if you know geriatrics, it's an age-based specialty for elderly adults. And I always tell my patients that they are the elderly children. And so that is sort of where my uh, expertise comes in. And so, um, you know, we I have a lot of overlap with doc what Dr. Schumer does, but I'm not an endocrinologist. Um, and so sort of the way that we divide things in our clinic is that Dr. Schumer will be one of the, will be the main provider who places blockers. Um, and then I, uh, you know, tend to see some intermediate level mental health um, patients and uh, before, you know, a referring to Dr. Quigley if needed, um, and but I also prescribe cross-sex hormones, which is what I'm going to talk about. So, so cross-sex hormones are the 
um, the big thing that people come to us for it, once they have hit puberty or if they have been on pubertal blockers and are at the age where they are ready to transition further. So testosterone, of course, is what we use to transition a uh, assigned female at birth person to a to be affirmed as male. And so um, we use testosterone, and the things that testosterone does are it um, increases facial hair, it helps drop the voice, um, it can uh, create changes in um, increasing muscle mass, uh, and these are irreversible changes. And so this is another reason why um, we often use pubertal blockers first if um, the uh, child is prepubertal because um, that is reversible. The, the, the blockers are a reversible treatment, whereas these have some irreversible effects. Um, so it's an injection. The way that we prescribe it is a subcutaneous injection, which is similar to how uh, people with diabetes give insulin injections, um, and it's once weekly. Uh, as Dr. Schumer said, it's uh, fairly affordable, even if insurance does not cover, and there are many coupons that are able to, uh, you know, families are able to get it at pretty low cost, and when I say low cost, I mean 10 to $20 a month. Um, we will follow labs every three months is usually our standard of care, both for um, patients on testosterone and on estrogen. So estrogen, we of course use for our trans females and uh, it is a daily pill that uh, is also pretty affordable. It's um, the advantage of testosterone and estrogen are that they have both been used for years in older adults. So testosterone for men with prostate cancer and other, and low T, as you've seen with all the commercials, and then estrogen for um, postmenopausal women. So since they have been around for so long, sort of the, the cost of it is uh, pretty low out of pocket. So um, we have the dosing here as far as estrogen goes, but I would say that um, the dosing that's here is the typical start rate for somebody who has been on pubertal blockers, and uh, we are able to use lower doses of estrogen in those patients. But if somebody has already gone through puberty and comes to us, we will need to use higher doses. So we have been starting around two to four milligrams, and we'll sometimes have to go up to six milligrams. And the reason that that's important is because the, the main risk of medical risk of starting estrogen is gonna be blood clots. And uh, this is you know, a risk that increases if somebody is a smoker or as they get older. And so the lower doses are sort of preferable to that. So this is just another reason to, if we can, um, place blockers before a patient hits puberty so that we are able to sort of mitigate some of this longer term risk. Question in the back. Oh, question in the back. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, if I understand, the um, why do we use this, mech this way of administering testosterone? So, um, and it, it sort of evolves. So in our clinic, we use it because it allows for pretty consistent um, blood levels over time, uh, as opposed to intramuscular infections there, or injections. There's um, often some spikes in blood levels of testosterone, which um, we prefer to not have. It also is less painful than an intramuscular injection. Um, other forms of testosterone, there's testosterone gel and like, um, it looks like deodorant that I've seen commercials for, but that the dose is not as reliable, uh, it, so we don't know what the patients are getting as much, and so that's where we come from with these injections. But we do have patients who are extremely needle phobic. Um, I would say that even most of those kids are um, able to reconcile their needle phobia um, because they are just so they they just need the testosterone so much. Um, but in rare cases, we have worked with patients about doing like testosterone gel. Um, and uh, si sorry, <laughs> similarly with estrogen, we can also do patches, um, but those are usually much more expensive. So we usually try starting with the pills. Yes. So once they get started on these hormones, um, it's a lifetime thing. It is. Um, yeah. So the question is, is this for life? And the answer is yes. If the, um, if, I mean, unless there is a re like a so there are very few medical reasons why we would stop uh, gender affirming hormones but you know in the theoretical case of um, you know uh, not being able to afford it or I mean it's 
So I guess I would say that discontinuation, there is not necessarily a large medical implication for discontinuing, but from a gender dysphoria standpoint, yes, they will have to take it for life. Yes, in the back there. We have them self-inject. So we, they receive, on the first visit that we prescribe, they receive teaching from one of our nurses or one of us on how to do injections, and then they do it. Over here. Right, so the question is about mood changes with higher doses of estrogen, and I think this also um, speaks to, people wanna know about mood changes with testosterone also. Um, so we have not seen uh, a lot of um, significant mood changes with the, with the estrogen dosing or testosterone really, and sort of my, um, my things that I tell uh, parents who are the ones who are usually concerned about it are, first of all, we're helping with gender dysphoria, so usually mood is better. Um, second, we are shooting for a blood level of testosterone that, and estrogen that is in the typical range for a man or woman. And you know, not all men are walking around wanting to punch people in the face. Um, not all <laughs> women are like crying all the time. So, um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I usually have pretty low concern for mood changes. Yeah, over here. Yeah, good question. So, um, so the. The, sh the, the overarching answer is that we don't have good science on the long-term effects of these medications used for this purpose. So as I mentioned before, testosterone and estrogen have been used for many years in older populations for different reasons. And so a lot of the risks that we talk to families about are based on those studies, but we really don't have good evidence about the long-term risks for um, young, healthy people who start in adolescence. Um, so, but the end, the other thing that I think complicates this is that historically trans people uh, are less likely to access medical care um, because of, you know, the problematic things within the healthcare system um, and, uh, you know, not having access to insurance and things like that. And so it's hard to know whether increased rates of, if there are increased rates of cancer, is it because they weren't getting screened because they don't come to care or is it because of hormones? I think we just don't know the answer to that yet. Okay, all right. So surgery, um, usually in our clinic, we, uh, the biggest surgery that we are dealing with commonly is top surgery for our trans men, uh, which is mastectomy. And um, otherwise, uh, so we'll talk about bottom surgery in a second, um, and breast augmentation occasionally for our trans gals. Um, as Dr. Schumer mentioned, we have many more trans guys than trans gals in our clinic. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why we see it. But so um, the, one of the questions is about sort of what are the criteria for having surgery. So you can have top surgery if you are under the age of 18. Um, there is no uh, sort of period of time that you have to be on hormones before you are allowed to have surgery. Um, but really the, the conversation about eligibility comes down to the um, surgeon, the, like what the surgeon decides about the appropriateness for the procedure and also letters of support for mental health professionals. So for children under the age of 18 to get the surgery, we do still require a letter of support from a mental health professional. Um, that is somewhat changing in adults, but um, that's for our patient population, that's kind of what we advise. And it is almost never covered by insurance. I say almost because I have a patient who um, is taking, their family is taking their insurance company to court about not paying for it, so we'll see what happens. Um, but we have not had pretty much any experience with mastectomy being covered. Um, so out of pocket in Michigan Medicine, there's a surgical package and it's about $10,000. And there are a couple other surgeons in the area that we use that um, their packages are around $6,000, so it is, uh, you know, a significant chunk of change. Um, bottom surgery, so we have, and, um, and breast augmentation, um, I mean, in, is more cosmetic, I think, in general, so it's even less likely to be covered. Um, so phalloplasty and metoidioplasty, that, so phalloplasty is creation of a penis, metoidioplasty is um, sort of an elongation or um, conversion of the clitoris into a penis-like structure, and that, so that's bottom surgery for our trans guys, and then vaginoplasty is 
creation of a penis. And so those of these are the bottom surgeries, but you, it's, they're not basically offered to anybody under 18 years old. And uh, to get bottom surgery, um, it requires two letters of support from separate mental health professionals. Um, they're quite expensive. We do perform the surgeries at Michigan Medicine. We have great plastic surgery team, um, but for the most part, we are not seeing our patients asking for that. Other things that we will sometimes talk about in our medical visit, um, some of the non-medication ways that uh, kids use to uh, socially transition, so breast binding. The reason, and the reasons that I talk about these things are basically because of medical concerns. So breast binding, um, you know, if done with a good fitting actual binder and not ace bandages or duct tape or anything like that, uh, is, can, is usually fine. I always recommend that kids uh, take a break from binding for at least eight hours. Um, you know, and also that it has to fit well. So uh, kids can complain of chest pain, breathing problems, bruising, and those are all you know things that uh, we will often talk about. Um, also for our trans guys, packing an STP, which is stands for stand to P device, and um, so. So an STP is a prosthetic and um, the, it's sort of like the cup is placed over the urethra and um, then the guy can stand to urinate in the bathroom. And so, um, you know, we offer guidance about sort of hygiene and making sure that there's um, no risk for UTI and things like that. Tucking for our trans gals, um, tucking the testicles and penis um, is generally, um, you know, uh, the, the biggest um, thing that I think of with tucking is possible fertility concerns because in order for sperm genesis, the, um, the testicles have to be at a certain temperature and it gets too warm for sperm production, but most of our patients don't care about that. Um, eating disorders, so we know that eating disorder behavior is higher in transgender patients. Um, we think that's partially because for our trans women, um, there's you know body image things that come with, as uh, Misha talked about in uh, the panel, um, but also um, sort of for our trans guys, potentially uh, not wanting to have breast growth uh, and sort of restrictive eating related to that. Um, so we will screen for eating disorders. We do sometimes manage medications for depression and anxiety if it's appropriate. And then, um, you know, the usual things that we talk to about all adolescents, so sexually transmitted infections, risk for um, pregnancy, and so testosterone is not birth control. You can still get pregnant on T. And so, um, you know, if, the, if a trans guy is, excuse me, still having penis and vagina sex, then we have to counsel on contraception. Uh, substance use and then complications of hormones. So that's, we generally do lab checks, but for the most part in young healthy people, we're not super concerned about that. So in terms of long-term data, so we kind of alluded to this. So this is the Dutch experience again. Um, and so what they did was they followed 55 transgender adults that they followed, so before puberty suppression, when they started cross-sex hormones and then after they had had uh, gender affirming surgery. And so after that surgery, their gender dysphoria was improved, their psychological functioning had improved, and in general, their well being was about the same as uh, young people from their uh, same, like their age match peers in the general population. So, you know, I think this is, uh, so we don't have a lot of evidence about sort of the long term outcomes of what happens to these kids when we do treat with blockers and hormones and surgery, but the, the small numbers that we have are very promising in terms of helping with gender dysphoria. So back to our cases. So this is Timmy, who um, I guess uh, is our uh, little um, gal who <laughs> wanted to chop off his penis. So yeah, so Timmy and then um, our other friend here. So these kids are both prepubertal. So I think the take home message is that um, in prepuberty, there is just not going to be necessarily a need for medication intervention. And as Dr. Schumer alluded to, um, you know, we in our clinic, Dr. Schumer will see some of these patients, but it's mainly a um, kind of counseling visit and we'll do serial pubertal exams and, you know, see a, a little bit more frequently when puberty starts to hit. 
And then this is a, a child who is, um, you know, of the age, closer to the age of puberty, but is on pubertal blockers. So this is something that gives this uh, child time to um, to explore gender identity and expression without having to worry about pubertal changes like um, breast growth or. Um, uh, I mean, you don't, you don't know whether this is breast growth or uh, like testicular development and all that. Um, but so, it, you know, it just allows a child to have more time. What's the time frame that you give the That's a good question. So we um, typically recommend starting pubertal blockers uh, at the very onset of puberty. Um, so with the, there's Tanner staging, which is the five different stages of physical development. And so uh, the optimal time is Tanner 2 to start pubertal blockers. Uh, so, pu so, and that's to kind of maximize the, the growth um, of the child and uh, sort of hit it right at the right time so we have uh, the least amount of time on blockers. As far as the cross-sex hormones, so um, Dr. Schumer mentioned that 16 was, when, was where the Dutch had recommended, but we are currently going down to around 14, um, as depending on the psychosocial development of the child and uh, how how long they have had puberty. So if it's a postpubertal child and they, you know, started menstruating at age 11, so they've already been pubertal and dysphoric for at least three years, and so we, you know, consider on a case by case basis. Yep. So and then these photos are of um, people, transgender people who had puberty blocked when they were children, and then proceeded with cross sex hormones. And um, this is, you know, these pictures show us that. Uh, they the, so these folks would all be able to pass, um, and they also probably for for example the trans guy wouldn't need to have a mastectomy because we were able to because they were able to have puberty blocked um, before any of these secondary sex characteristics developed, and so um, you know I think it just shows the power of the the importance of trying to especially now with kids coming out younger and younger that we are able to block when we can so that uh, we can have a smoother uh, less dysphoric transition hopefully so and then one last moment about political and logistic challenges that we encounter so there is still some a per perception that gender dysphoria is psychiatric or not medical so things like it's a phase they they want to be a boy not that they are a boy so there's this sort of distinction and um, so I think that that is getting better but really we do consider gender dysphoria to be a medical diagnosis and so and that is what I always say is my the thing that I'm treating so um, you know the the teen in front of me will say that my goals for starting on testosterone for example are to get facial hair and to get a deeper voice but my as a physician my reason for treating is to treat the gender dysphoria um, because we know that uh, doing nothing is not a neutral option for these kids um, because of uh, the sort of danger of continuing with gender dysphoria uh, lack of mental health personnel skilled in assessing gender dysphoric children, which is now not an issue, right? Because you all are here. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I, I and this is, I really um, echo what other people have said about the great turnout here because I think it is. Um, really heartwarming that there are so many people interested in working with these youth um, because that is going to sort of take care of that uh, barrier that we often have. Among the pediatric community, there is a lot of anxiety still about, you know, doing these treatments that uh, may cause permanent changes to young children. Uh, and so, you know, we are, and the reality is that we don't have as much evidence as we do for other treatments for children, but we are working on it. And again, um, feeling like doing nothing is not a neutral option. Um, we feel like, you know, we, we do need to treat these kids. And I would say also that for people who are in communities that don't have that you know that don't have a children's hospital, the as you've seen the the hormones that we prescribe, especially for uh, cross sex hormones, are not there aren't a lot of meds that we use. So um, this is something that a general pediatrician or a family practitioner can be become familiar with. And so if there's a provider in the community that is comfortable with this, um, you know you wouldn't necessarily have to come all the way down to Ann Arbor. Um, I mean, we love the business, but we're happy to 
to spread the love. So um, costs we kind of talked about, insurance coverage, and then political. So not only the bathroom laws, but um, you know, with the current, uh, the current. This is now my my. This statement is not reflect the views of the University of Michigan. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, with the current administration is just you know I don't see that there's going to be any leeway for our trans patients in terms of increasing coverage or prioritization. You know, I just was reading that the Health and Human Services. Um, uh, strategic plan draft that came out had removed all mention of LGBT persons in terms of priorities and uh, for health care and you know I think that uh, with uh, sort of restrictions to the ACA that are potentially on the horizon, um, threats to health coverage for transgender people who are often, um, you know, reliant on things like the ACA to help get insurance. Uh, I just, you know, I think this is a great area for advocacy so that uh, we, so that these folks don't lose their health insurance and their health coverage and access to the care that they need. So, okay. <laughs> So, okay, so we're almost done. So puberty blockers, so, um, you know, puberty blockers are great for decreasing dysphoria related to sexual development, and they can help avoid surgery later in life. Um, also, the gender-affirming hormones, which cross-sex hormones, uh, can also dramatically de decrease dysphoria, you know, as... Um, you know, as the, the kids on the panel said, it, it really is a dramatic difference pre and post. Well, coming out is one step. Starting on hormones is another step that really, and even just the hope of uh, getting on hormones often sort of changes kids' um, personalities. So um, in terms of medical referrals, so prepubertal and postpubertal, all those kids can benefit from consultation with a medical provider, even if it's just for information. Um, but we also need to work very closely with our mental health providers, especially in children, um, before we institute any of these medical interventions. So now that's it. And <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you, Ellen. Do we have time uh, for questions? Yeah, we do have time for questions. I just want to throw one more thing in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Is that, you know, I, I, I'm careful to say that, you know, it's great if someone presents at the onset of puberty that we can talk about pubertal blockers, but realistically, the majority of our patients are coming to us when they're 15, 16, right. 17 years old after, you know, puberty has already almost completed. And we're really treating them the same way we would treat a transgender adult. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, while it's good to talk about puberty blockers, it's not, it's not something that um, is right for everyone, and there's no right time to come out as transgender. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to make that clear. 